These are images from some of our earlier television programs about novels, 19th century novels. Each image is different in its way, just as the fictions to which it relates are different. But they also have many things in common. They are local images, English, French, American or Russian. That is, they are images of the writer's native lands. And they are parts of the landscapes of those writers' everyday experiences. Even though in cases like Wuthering Heights, for example, the writer has used landscape to transform, to transcend everyday reality. What else do such images have in common? The settings they provide for novels, the settings they refer us back to, are full of everyday detail, the closely observed shared experiences of 19th century lives. They are images of a recognizable, apparently real world. In other words, like the novels themselves, these images refer us back to a world of shared, accepted reality. Not just topographical or physical reality, but to a world in which a moral consensus exists. A world in which there is an assumed area of agreement about the nature of society and its members. About the relationship between society and its members. And in this world, there is also an implicit agreement about the relationship between author and readers. Implicitly, we expect answers to or help with the questions these landscapes and characters present. We expect, when we read about and accept the 19th century novelist's world, to be conducted through it, to have things explained for us in ways that we can relate to our own experiences. 19th century novelists accept and represent the reality of the worlds they feel they know and we, in accepting those representations, accept and share in that reality. That, of course, is not to say that such shared assumptions preclude or diminish writers' ability to criticize. On the contrary, to think for a moment of Cousin Bert or what Balzac has to say about post-revolutionary Paris and its fictional inhabitants, is to see that to assume the existence and shared nature of a society is by no means to accept its morality or to condone its nature. Another example will make this clearer. The world of Mansfield Park. The house itself is hardly there, not in any detail, but yet it exists as solidly in the story as if every detail were carefully described and it exists as far more than a house or building. It stands as a moral setting, a place in the mind representing and protecting a whole way of life, a whole system of values in which Jane Austen believes. And it is the same with, say, Thomas Hardy's Wessex. Wessex is there, its details and its living history are threaded through the novel, giving a background of shared reality which is fully alive, is known and accepted by its imaginary inhabitants as well as its real readers. So strongly known that the film camera can approach it, convey some of its qualities, point out that Hardy's world has, as he put it himself, something real for its basis. Such reality is not so much a place which we can go and visit or film, although it is that, but more important, it is an effect, an idea, a set of assumptions about external reality, which we are led to believe in. Authors may disapprove of characters' actions, they may point to the gaps between social appearance and private morality, they may even argue that individuals cannot live their true lives within their societies, but their point is ultimately dependent on our willingness to accept these fictional worlds whose social and economic existence is never questioned. Let me put it another way. These landscapes, these buildings, which are offered us, are not, of course, realities because they are fictions. Nevertheless, they are fictions which have their counterparts in an objective world, a world outside all of us, one that we can share and talk about, certain that we are all referring to the same things. 
It is ultimately more than a question of a moral consensus, although that is continually implied in the 19th century novel. It is more fundamental. It is a consensus about the nature of reality, about the significance of human actions as manifestations of and clues to human character. It is a consensus about the relationship between language and reality, an acceptance of the conventions of realism, if you like. We know people by their acts, just as we know their worlds by their external features, their buildings, their landscapes. The real world of the 19th century realist text is real insofar as we share in it, insofar as we accept it, we talk about it and read about it, confident that we will be understood, that we are understanding what a novelist wants us to know. More images, this time of 19th century Brussels, respectable, pseudo-classical, solid. The external signs of the monarchy of Leopold II, King of the Belgians, from 1865 to 1909. In 1876, he had founded a great society, the International Association for the Suppression of Slavery and the Opening Up of Central Africa. He expressed its aims like this. To open up to civilization, the only area of the globe to which it has not yet penetrated, to pierce the gloom which hangs over entire races, this constitutes, if I may dare to put it in this way, a crusade worthy of this century of progress. Other images tell the truth. The International Association was a racket. Its aims were simple, to find an area of Africa not yet carved up by the other powers, Marlowe's blank space in the map, and to bleed it dry. This Leopold proceeded to do. The Congo Free State became his private property. He was answerable to no one for his actions. If this reality was perceived, few people seemed to care very much. From the outside, from Brussels, Paris and London, it all looked respectable and worthy. Joseph Conrad, though, who was briefly involved in the adventures of the Great Trading Company, saw it differently. In 1890, he really did go up the Congo. He went there as a merchant seaman, following work, and he stayed for six months. It was one further adventure in a life which, up to that point, had been a series of adventures, far removed from the lives of the 19th century English men or women of letters. Born in Poland in 1857, he had been exiled with his parents to Russia in 1862, when only four years old. Then, after the death of his parents, at the age of 16, he went to France, to Marseille, where he began his long apprenticeship to the sea in 1874. From there, he went to England, where he spent a further 15 years working his way up to become an officer in the merchant navy. And it was during this time that he visited the Congo. Conrad's Congo journey is the only part of his life from which a personal diary survives. It contains brief entries about the overland part of his journey. He went in June 1890 to Kinshasa. Then there is the upriver book which consists of navigational notes for taking a boat up from Kinshasa to Bangala. He had come to take over the command of one of the small river steamers which plied the Congo River for Leopold's trading company. But the steamer was not ready, and so he was placed on another steamer, the Roi des Belges, for a practice run of a thousand miles up to Stanley Falls. Once there, they picked up a sick agent of the company who was very ill. On the way back, he died. The captain of the steamer also fell ill, so Conrad commanded the Roi des Belges for the rest of the trip. Then he too grew ill and had to go home to England. By 1898, Conrad had settled here in Pent Farmhouse near Ashford in Kent. He was by now a full-time writer. In appearance, the English literary gentleman once voted the best dressed man in London he said it was damn nonsense. His son, John Conrad, remembers something of his father's life in Kent and what he told him of his Polish boyhood. I think he must have had a very unhappy time in Poland. Um, he was devoted to his father, to whom I suppose gave him most of his tuition in exile, and then later on he went to a school in Krakow. 
But it wasn't a happy period. His father was dying, and he was living in the room next to the sick bay. And um, he'd finish his uh, evening preparation and sit there with virtually nothing to do, no toys. He'd only have a book to read. And um, it must have weighed a tremendous lot on the boy of 11 to sit there waiting for his father to die, which is what it amounted to. And then, of course, later on, he never discussed any of his books with any of the family, not sort of en famille. He'd talk over a passage with my mother. He'd um, ask her what she thought of this or that or the other. But um, as regards discussing the whole program of a book or the priestly of it, perhaps, um, he never did that at all. He didn't do it with either my brother or I or my mother. It was very much a private life. It was completely two lives, really, in that house. One, the author, and the other, the father and boss of the family. <laughs> my father only adopted uh, the use of the word name Conrad because there were so many uh, variations in the spelling <laughs> of the Polish name. And if you look in the London uh, Maritime Museum, you'll find that his name is spelled 14 different ways on one page. As time developed, and I began to notice his writing habits, uh, I found that he, um, shall we say, didn't really start writing a book, or a page for that matter, until quite late at night, half past nine, or 10 o'clock at night after we'd had dinner. And he'd go on writing then to half past three or four in the morning when he would come up to bed. George Sartoris, the engineer, asked him some question about the Rada Belge, the steam boat. And J.C. said, yes, um, that was a terrible business. I had to rebuild the damn thing before I could use it. <laughs> and apparently the boat had been hauled up on the side and they'd taken some of the gunnels uh, bulwarks off. And my father had to reinstate them and refasten them, which he did by himself with only a native to help. I've never known anybody read so well aloud as he did. To listen to him reading aloud, it was an absolute joy. It was like a, listening to a good choir. It gave you tremendous satisfaction. And I remember on one occasion, he said, you know, it isn't just a question of writing the words down. They've got to be written down in an order in which they can be read and read sensibly. Joseph Conrad's life in this English country house in the 1890s, the retired and respectable life of the Englishman of letters, might have led the reader to expect that Heart of Darkness, when it appeared in 1899, would be a story firmly in the traditions of Victorian fiction. And the magazine which had commissioned the work for serial publication would also have led us to expect something conventional. Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine was conservative and muscular in tone. As Conrad remarked, one was in decent company there and had a good sort of public. There isn't a single club and mess room in Man of War in the British Seas and Dominions which hasn't its copy. Heart of Darkness seems to begin like a typical Blackwood's adventure tale in that quiet moment on the Thames below Gravesend. But what do we make of this? And on we went again into the silence, along empty reaches, round the still bends, between the high walls of our winding way. Trees, trees, millions of trees, massive, immense, running up high, and at their foot, Hugging the bank against the stream, crept the little begrimed steamboat, like a, like a sluggish beetle crawling on the floor of a lofty portico. It made you feel very small, very lost. And yet it was not altogether depressing, that feeling. After all, if you were small, the grimy beetle crawled on, which was just what you wanted it to do. Where the pilgrims imagined it crawled to, I don't know some place where they expected to get something, I bet. For me, it crawled towards Kurz, exclusively. The reaches opened before us and closed behind, as if the forest had stepped leisurely across the water to bar the way for our return. 
we penetrated deeper and deeper into the heart of darkness. It was very quiet there. At night, sometimes, the roll of drums behind the curtain of trees would run up the river and remain sustained faintly as if hovering in the air high over our heads till the first break of day. Whether it meant war, peace, or prayer, we could not tell. The dawns were heralded by the descent of a chill stillness. The woodcutters slept, their fires burned low. The snapping of a twig would make you start. We were wanderers on prehistoric Earth, on an Earth that wore the aspect of an unknown planet. We could have fancied ourselves the first of men taking possession of a cursed inheritance under the droop of heavy and motionless foliage. The steamer toiled along, slowly on the edge of a black and incomprehensible frenzy. The prehistoric man was cursing us, praying to us, welcoming us. We could tell. We were cut off from the comprehension of our surroundings. We glided past like phantoms, wandering and secretly appalled, as sane men would be before an enthusiastic outbreak in a madhouse. We could not understand because we were too far, and could not remember because we were traveling in the night of first ages, and those ages that are gone, leaving hardly a sign and no memories. Our joint memories, the collective memories of our culture and civilization, seem to have disappeared. Indeed, it's as if they never existed. The dominant feeling here, I think, is of the frightening incomprehensibility of this experience. The jungle is mad, dark, misty, primordial, meaningless. It refuses to make sense to those people who look into it. Of course, it may seem to make sense to Marlowe's fellow pilgrims in the trading company, but their idea of what it means is just base and ultimately hollow. They are Eliot's hollow men. Beneath their pretense of philanthropy of spreading civilization, they are concerned only with ivory, with that trickle of ivory that comes out of the jungle for their own purposes. Beyond that, they never look nor question. Now, the contrast between this piece of writing and it's symptomatic of the whole novel, and the prose of, say, Mansfield Park is strikingly obvious. But, again, it is so much more than just a contrast of settings or locations, isn't it? To say that the Congo Free State is a long way in time and space from Mansfield Park, from Talbotay's Dairy, from Middlemarch, is to state that obvious point. But Conrad's handling of the experience, his very choice of it as the subject of his fiction, brings home the deeper, more important divergences between those shared, apparently objective worlds whose images we glimpsed at the beginning of this program, and the world of the modern or earlier 20th century novel. Marlowe doesn't even understand his own narrative. Or, to put it another way, he understands only its fundamental incommunicability. At one point, he breaks off his story and grapples before his listeners with the difficulty of what he is trying to describe. Kurtz, then, was just a word for me. I did not see the man in the name any more than you do. Do you see him? Do you see the story? Do you see anything? It seems to me I am trying to tell you a dream, making a vain attempt, because no relation of a dream can convey the dream sensation that commingling of absurdity, surprise, and bewilderment. No, it is impossible. It is impossible to convey the life sensation of any given epoch of one's existence, that which makes its truth, its meaning, its subtle and penetrating essence. It is impossible. We live as we dream, alone. Nevertheless, Marlowe goes on. We are condemned to try and find meaning in our experiences, even if it seems as if there is no shared reality outside ourselves, no set of assumptions by which we can live. Kurtz, the remarkable man, who is the object of Marlowe's journey, becomes the symbol of how a man might make sense of these events. He is one of the progressives, the gang of virtue, but he too has been absorbed by the jungle of meaninglessness. Not just because he's gone native and yielded to the savage greed of the great trading company and set himself up as a god in the process, but because of his message for Marlowe,
for the reader the message which he has learned by looking intensely into himself in the wilderness. What is that message? It is just the horror, the horror. After delivering it, he too is absorbed by the darkness, becoming just something buried in a muddy hole. That seems to be the climax of Marlowe's voyage and the focus of the novel. It is profoundly ambivalent. Is it self-condemnation, a judgment made at death's door? What has he found out about himself? Or is it a condemnation of the whole horrible absurdity of life which allows any kind of conduct to prosper or to continue? Heart of Darkness is more than just an anti-imperialist fable, although it is that too. The identification with Kurtz, which Marlowe feels, and which the reader, the decent Blackwoods reader, is invited to share, is a, an identification with a kind of truth that defeats familiar 19th century modes of expression. What Kurtz acknowledges, and what Marlowe discovers, is that the outward form of things, like the outward respectability of the company, their public shared significance is totally misleading. Common beliefs and ideas, the outward images of solid reality, are really only outward images. The darkness which lies at the center of the story also lies at the center of all human activity waiting to be found, as it cannot be, in the shared, solid-seeming world of 19th century fiction, but can be in that utter solitude without a policeman experienced by Marlowe, and perhaps by Conrad too. And not by Conrad just in the jungles of the Congo, but in a sense in his whole accursed inheritance of a displaced, homeless past, which we can see as the displaced, homeless past of a whole generation of writers, from Conrad to Joyce to Lawrence. Like these later modernist writers, Conrad explores the nature of narrative itself and its ability or inability to convey the modern experience. As we've seen from those images of earlier programs with which we began, the earlier writers worked within a more settled and familiar notion of what reality was and how it might be conveyed. But with Conrad, we leave the familiar and the secure, and under the pressure of knowing what is really happening and can happen in the modern world, we enter into the dark, uncertain territory of unknowing. Like Kurtz has intended at the end of the tale, we may prefer the lie, the conventional ending, so that normal life can go on, her name on Kurtz's dying lips as Marlowe fabricates it for her. But if we prefer the lie, we prefer it at the cost of refusing to face the horror of our times, the horror on which civilized life is ultimately based.